Good morning and welcome to the Wavy Digital Desk. Today we're here with Supervisory Special Agent Stacey Sullivan. We're going to be speaking about internet safety, what your kids need to know, how to help them get through this year, doing schoolwork online, navigating the online world with friends on social media and so forth. So Stacey, can you just tell us a little bit about your role? I know that you've been going into schools recently educating kids on what they need to know. Sure. So like you said, my name is Stacy Sullivan and I run a squad in the FBI Norfolk office and they address uh, crimes against children as well as other violent crime in our seven cities. And, you know, throughout that, I mean, what is it like teaching these kids? Do they already know everything you're saying? Are they interested in what you're saying? Are they scared about what you're saying? So typically what we've been doing and over the past year, we've really made a push to get out into the schools because our biggest tool in fighting the online world of targeting children is to educate the children themselves. Um, most of the children that we talk to are between the ages of six or in the sixth grade to eighth grade age range. And a lot of times they're super familiar with what I'm already talking about and they volunteer even more information. So they're welcoming, they're welcoming the open conversation about it and they always wanna share more. So it's been really interesting to see kids' responses to, hey, this is how you can be safe on the internet. Um, they don't just tune you out. Um, and we also tell them about real life situations of kids their age and what's happened to them if they per se uh, share their passwords with somebody they don't know online. A lot of kids these days, and it's a totally different world from some of us say my age, uh, when we grew up, we didn't just pe uh, befriend people online that we didn't know. A lot of children today are friends with people they've never met, they're even dating people they've never met, and online gaming with strangers. So us equipping them as much as we can with some tools that if they were to be approached by a stranger, here's the signs to look out for, here's what you can be alert that this person uh, may be somebody different than what they're portraying online. Right, and that's scary, right, as a parent. I mean, you wanna protect them from, you know, and we're gonna get into it, you know, surfing online and, you know, running into some things that you shouldn't, but to be having friends that are sort of anonymous or you don't get to meet them, you don't get to meet their parents, you don't get to bring them into your home. Like you want your kid to be equipped to handle these situations. That's right, no matter how much a parent or a teacher or a trusted adult tries to um, prevent certain things online, where there is a will, there is a way, and the kids are going to um, be free online at times where a parent is not available. So equipping a child is probably the best form of defense we can do and having those like open conversations with children is the best thing you can do because we're we're past the singular online forum and right. the online platform and we're into a whole new world of things that a lot of parents are not familiar with. So I've instructed the friends that I have with their children, just have conversations, let them teach you about the apps they're on. Let them teach you about that online gaming forum and really be open to learning about it so that you can ask follow-up questions on their interests because this is something that is totally new to a lot of parents um, with the with the widespread online app and online gaming. Right, and that's interesting. So like you want your parents to like be involved. You want them to know the apps and the systems their kids are using. You don't want them to be navigating it alone. That's right, and I'm not saying that the parent would have to get on the app or yeah. anything like that, but I think when a parent shows interest in their to their child about something that they're on online, it opens up a whole new world mm -hmm. for them. And then, you know, with these kids, it's it's difficult to say nowadays, like, hey, like I'm gonna take away all your technology. You need to use it for school. You might then have a computer at school if you don't at home or vice versa. I mean, it, I can't even imagine, be very difficult in today's world to sort of remove technology from the world completely. Is that how you all feel like it's important to equip them because technology is everywhere for them right now? That's right. So even with a Chromebook, something as simple as a school Chromebook, you have to be careful not to sync your other devices to that Chromebook, right? So when you go into a home and it connects to the Wi-Fi and all your devices are synced, some of that could wind up on a Chromebook and on the school system. So you just have to be very cognizant of teaching your child how to prevent themselves from um, posting anything they shouldn't be posting, um, Googling things um, that are inappropriate, just again, armoring them with their own tools so that they know the signs to look out for. Um, one, of the big, one of the big problems in some of the schools that we've been to is airdropping, right? Mm -hmm. Most kids have a phone these days, and when they're airdropped, they don't necessarily know what to do with those images, or they share them with their friend. They're like, oh my gosh, look at this. What do I do with this? And so we teach kids kind of what you can do with in that type of a situation, especially if you're mortified that that is now on your device. You know, a lot of those times, um, kids aren't expecting that kind of thing to appear on their phone. And we teach them skills and things that they could do to either tell a parent, report it to law enforcement, or even um, be able to submit it 
on their own to um, a site that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has. It's called takeitdown.nickmick.org. And that is a new, um, newer website where they could go and you can transfer a picture from an electronic device to that website and they will take it down. So it, you, then you can delete it off your site. But what happens is Nick Mick puts um, like a thumbprint or a hash value to it. And that photo can then be recognized um, if it were to pop up on wow. another device. So if kids are, you know, feeling, you know, shame or guilt that this has wound up with them, they can even take matters into their own hands now, which is even, which is wonderful because they can work to get these images off their own device um, without having to go through all those formal channels. And, you know, you spoke about, you know, the dangers of sort of surfing online and we'll get into some of those, um, you know, safe internet surfing tips in a second, but to have it then, you know, explicit photo probably be dropped to you. Like you don't even actively search it. You know, it's dropped on your phone, your device, your, you know, your main uh, line really to life. Right. It's right there. And I don't know. I mean, that's such a difficult situation for a kid to be in about how do I tell an adult, will they believe me when I, someone says that, you know, it's been airdropped. Right. So this with this website, it's totally an anonymous submission. So it doesn't have to say mm -hmm. the child's name or a parent's name associated with it. It doesn't tag your device. It's totally anonymous. And you can just submit the phone because typically when we run these cases that are um, child exploitation in, in nature, um, we share all of those images with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they identify people. So that helps you know, a child be identified or a victim be identified um, so that they can receive the proper resources in the future. So really that child or that parent that sees that image is, is helping someone. So we talked about AirDrop, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, different apps, anonymous friendships that people can form online. I mean, what are some of the other big internet threats that you all are seeing or that kids are sharing with you right now? Sure. So we have a huge issue and I think, um, it really got heightened over the pandemic and post pandemic because everybody was at home right. and everybody was um, virtual. So it ramped up quite a bit. Um, and the one of the bigger things that we're seeing is the um, this made up word, which is sextortion. And basically it's an adult portraying to be a kid or portraying to be somebody else that they're not and extorting a child. So they're friending a child. They're saying, hey, let me help you with your homework or what movie do you like? And they're developing a trust. And then they get to where a child shares something inappropriate, whether it be a picture, whether it be a fact about themselves, mm -hmm. and then they turn it around and blackmail them, which is the more layman's terms. And they blackmail them and say, if you don't send me more of this same thing, whether it be a picture or something, um, then I'm going to blast it to all of your friend network, or I'm gonna tell a parent or a coach. And that child really um, takes that very seriously. And then they get nervous or embarrassed to tell a parent and they find out like months later. Um, a lot of times it's not reported because they don't think we're ever gonna find that person mm -hmm. on the other end. And I want to kind of quash that that false that falsehood because we are able to find those people quite a bit. Um, and a lot of times, recently the FBI had, an, had a global initiative about financial motivated sextortion. So if anybody were to ever ask a child for money to keep a, to keep a picture, um, private and not blast it out more. That's also when a parent should immediately tell local, um, state or federal law enforcement, hey, this happened. And you know, the, our, child, our children are always the victims in these situations. They're being groomed online. Um, they're being coerced to do things that they wouldn't normally do in their normal childhood phases. So that's how we treat them. So anytime a child would say this happened to me, we treat it as such and we go after the person on the other end. And, you know, to what you just said, we've heard parents, you know, have shame over this kind of thing or kids, you know, someone in the family. But what you're saying is really you can do something about it in some of these situations. So it's worth making that call. It's worth reaching out to you all. That's right. And also when you do make that call and we do are notified, we can then help the child through resources. We can get them the proper um, counseling they may need or resources, resources to get past that embarrassment or that moment um, because it's just a moment and we can move on from that. But because it has ramped up so much, we just wanna be able to put that out there that you can call somebody and they will treat the situation individually and with the utmost privacy for the child. Um, 
And in fact, now we even have children calling us to report that it's happened to them. And I think a lot of that is because the word is getting out and it, it's helpful when a child calls, but we typically call the parents back and we double check that they've talked to their parent about it before we would move further. So it's, it's nice that even the kids are feeling empowered now to be able to call themselves and say, hey, this weirdo online is asking for the following things and I'm uncomfortable. Wow. And then for them to have that education too, and the word out, you know, kudos obviously to you all. I mean, they know that probably because of resources that are put out in the community about what exists, about knowing that, you know, you all can help them. And I also think we, so we're also speaking community forums mm -hmm. and going to um, public forums around, around Hampton Roads so that even the parents and teachers, I think, um, are pushing the information themselves. So I think the parents are, are largely the educators now, and in the home, they're showing them, hey, this is how you can be safe online, you can navigate through your apps this way, this is what you can watch out for. So I think the parents and teachers are also even tuned in more to it, and that is a huge success um, to have them talking about it themselves. And there's this idea that you all have, and um, you know, I found it too on the FBI website that you all have, but you can never educate kids too young. You know, that's a statement we've heard. And I think, you know, sometimes you don't want to, I guess, like getting airdropped an explicit photo. You don't want to sort of alert someone about something they might not know. But in that instance, these kids are getting stuff at school and they might not have had that conversation with a parent. So, you know, you need to educate your kids even younger sort of about some of these threats. That's right. We um, have seen victims as young as seven. Um, that have been communicating with somebody online and kind of fallen into that web. Um, but our, our site, FBI.gov, has a great kind of game on it um, called Safe Online Surfing, and it targets third grade through eighth graders, and it's age appropriate based on the grade that they're in. They can go select their grade and they can navigate through the game. They can like win prizes and answer questions that would be appropriate for their level. Like, can your car connect to the internet? Do all cars connect to the internet? So a, a question like that would be more of a sixth grader level, and it teaches them kind of how to navigate the internet on top of what a parent or teacher has already told them. And actually, there's a competition coming up that's starting um, September 1st, which is next Friday, I believe. Um, so teachers could even incorporate that into their learning program because it's a, it's a obviously a safe and reputable game that they could talk about how different um, rules for internet safety could apply to their child in their grade level. And that's interesting because I guess, you know, obviously as you get older, you're in more deep research projects or using the internet in different avenues, especially as you get into college. But, you know, sure. for middle school, when you're just getting that digital literacy, you know, sort of education, what should kids even do? They're going on the internet, they're going to Google something. Are there things parents can help guide them through? Hey, you know, stick to the keywords that you're trying to search. Don't go off into any rogue sites. Here are the sites that are good for you. I mean, what are some tips that parents can sort of use? Sure. So um, I've often sourced people back to NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. There's some great information on there that's probably too voluminous to share. But a lot of times, like, parents can set controls and, like, parental controls on the devices in the home and put keywords that would be striking, um, that would be they would be notified if their child... Um, accidentally looked it up or typed it in because they didn't know what it meant and then they would be alerted and be able to have that conversation of hey this was inappropriate because abc mm -hmm. right and what may be inappropriate to one family isn't less inappropriate to another family so it's whatever the family feels um should be the guidelines for their internet usage a lot of times also um, we encourage like a uh, device shut down at night like a communal space where devices will be for the night like whether whether they put their um devices down at 8 p.m 9 p.m 10 p.m so that they know they're not going to bed with them and, and causing like rumors or gossip late yeah. at night with their school friends mm -hmm. and going, going to school with anxiety the next day. So we do like a device curfew. We, we suggest that um, just so everybody puts their phones in the same place at night before they go to bed. Right. Yeah. That, that probably helps. You know, no secrets, no gossip, as you said, right. you know, sort of keeping it out in the open. Right, mm -hmm. and gossip's still going to happen yeah. with, with everybody, but at least it wouldn't maybe affect them in the late hours of the night where they couldn't sleep and start their school day off in a different place than they would have. Absolutely, and then, you know, we talked about how to take some photos down if there are explicit photos, but, you know, what tips do you share to kids to maybe not be in that situation in the first place, or, or what 
rules in terms of being public and private online. I mean, now there are so many different accounts. There are so many variations of what, you know, privacy means on all these apps. So, I mean, where do you start with kids? Sure. So the first thing I share with um, kids as young as like seven, as long when they first start having internet, internet access and when they can understand what that means, because we all know that the babies watch the iPhones at dinner so that they're not screaming and that's helpful sometimes or or they're watching the iPad when they're shopping and that's great because they have a movie they can watch to keep them content. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about kids that kind of are a little bit older that are comprehending what they're doing on the internet. Um, so what was your, I'm sorry, can oh, you say that's the right. last yeah. part? No, just curious, you know, for um, the whole privacy versus public information that kids can get out on the internet. Sure. So we just encourage them not to share like their family's mm -hmm. names, their siblings' names. We encourage them not to tell where they live, where they go to school. Um, a lot of cases that we've had in the past several years, the kids have identified where they go to school. They'll take a picture mm -hmm. of themselves in front of school. So then we have to worry about is the is the offender or the predator going to show up at their school, mm -hmm. right? And so then we notify school resource officers. So things like that. Just be very cognizant of what they share because although the predator may not take that action, they can use that information against them. So if they're like, hey, my dad works in the military or my mom um, works in the military, um, the, the predator can then use that against them. If you don't send me this, I'm going to tell your dad's commander, right? So the kid or the child would then think, oh my gosh, that's real, but it's because he or she shared that information originally. So be very careful about what you share. We also go into some churches and community groups and share the same um, internet safety call. And a lot of times I'll take one of the leaders and say, okay, come on up. And I'm like, have you and I ever met before? And they'll say no. And I said, so this is the first time we're meeting. And it's a bunch of children that they all love. And they were like, yes. And I was like, okay, so let's talk about what you've posted online. And it's not, it's not private. I could just look at it as a normal, as a normal person. I'm not doing anything super secret about it. And I can tell you where they live, what their child's name is, who they're married to, where they work, their phone number. And, and that's a moment. It's not to say get off, get off the online forums. It's just to say lock it down a little bit more and be a little bit more private so that the average person can't find out all of that about you and use it against you. Wow. Potentially. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm sure obviously in your line of work, in my line of work, I've, you know, we've seen what can be on the internet. It's really easy to look up someone's digital footprint. Is that what you call it? You know, on the internet, whether it's them selling a house, whether it's their profile on Facebook, whether they're tagged in something on Facebook or tagged in something in other elements. I mean, to be in photos and to not have control over it as well, you know, do you ever get kids telling you about, hey, I was tagged in these photos at a party or I was, you know, interacting with this group and they're public? I mean, are there issues like that that you hear about ever? So there are, um, and we, the, a lot of those are individually based. Mm -hmm. So also when we go out and we talk about, hey, what type of career do you want? What type of things are you looking to do when you get out of school? We talk about those types of photos and how they could resurface or how... Um, you could be portrayed in a different light than who you are because you're in the background. So a lot of times we just encourage kids, and this, this kind of sounds archaic, but it, it works, is to encourage kids to say, just, just let me know if you're going to tag me, if you're going to put that picture up, and I'll let you know if that's okay. And it, it is a little archaic because people are going to share what they want to share, but the only thing they can do after that picture is taken is please let me know if you're going to post it, right? Because they could untag themselves potentially or ask the person to untag them. Um, so they can kind of take it into their own hands with that. But as they get older, you know, jobs are looking back to their first um, digital media like expression. So they're looking back to when they first had an online profile right. and they're looking back to make sure that's the person that they want um, for the job. So we encourage them for that as well. And then, you know, going forward, I think as kids move into this year and kids are starting school now, they're going to start school after Labor Day, so we're right on the cusp of when they're heading back. Are there certain things that, you know, even maybe teachers can help them with going in the classroom with homework? I mean, do you guys rely on sort of educators to help with some of this, you know, online education? Sure. In most school systems, they have um, safety protocols in place and privacy um, among their network. So I think the schools are individual with how they do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we just, when we can, we come in and, and talk with the teachers and the students and give even more tips of, of what they could do to, um, to protect their own. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we went through, 
you know, a, a big overview of sort of some of the things you're hearing, but are there any things that you really want to highlight that pop up for some of these conversations when you're going into schools? We do often share um, with the young people, do not give your passwords to anybody. That's also kind of outside of per se my generation. It's kind of a newer generation thing. Don't give your passwords to your friends, to anyone else, except maybe a parent, if that's the connection that the parent has with monitoring the phone system, their phones or like a trusted adult, but don't share passwords with your friends. Oftentimes we see that maybe one child is getting extorted and they're compelled to give the predator, the person online targeting them a password or a name of a friend. And then that, that predator moves on to the second friend because they were, they received it from the first friend. So the less you share, the better, especially if you've never met someone. So often like a parent could could go through social media with their child and say, who are you talking to? How do you know that person? When was the last time you saw that person? Or what was the last phone call you had with that person? And if that child can address that, then probably they know that person. If they can't, that should send up some alarm bells and they could you know, talk more about that person and see if that's really somebody they should be talking to. And then you mentioning passwords just had, uh, I had one more thought about location. So location sharing is something that you can do on apps, on Facebook, sometimes you can say, I'm here, this is where I am, here's a photo I took. There's a lot of different ways to track where you are across sure. the globe. What is your take sort of on how public you should be with that information? And, and you can decide even on your cell phone how specific you want the location to track. I mean, where do you all stand with all of that information out there? So a lot of people have a lot of different um, ideas on that. I don't think turning your location sharing off is necessarily a good thing mm -hmm. because if a child is missing, oftentimes that is a huge tool that law enforcement can do to help find a missing child. And we, we do that quite often. But being careful not to say, oh, I'm on vacation. I'm enjoying this place right now, knowing that somebody knows now that your house is empty or that an adult is not home. Share those things after you get back. Um, share that meal that you had that you want to take a picture of this amazing um, restaurant after you're done with it. Um, just so it's not live, somebody is not going to show up there to meet somebody. And that's good for adults to take into mind too. Just be careful that you're not um, posting real-time things um, because somebody may be using that information. And I don't mean be paranoid about it, but just make sure if you're posting something, you would be okay if somebody you had been talking to that you had not met um, were to address where you've been or what you had posted. And definitely don't post um, things while you're on vacation, post it when you get back so that no one thinks you're, no one believes that your house is empty and no one's home, just as a own matter of privacy for yourself and your children. Right, and yeah. thank you for saying the thing about being scared. Certainly want people to be vigilant, but don't want them to have extra stress or worry. That's right. But I think, you know, hopefully conversations like this and the work that you do is just a good education tool in how to be vigilant and how to be aware so that you don't have to cross that line to you know, potentially a more toxic situation. That's right, there's plenty of safe things on the internet, there's plenty of ways to look through the internet, educate yourself, so we definitely don't want people to shut down their online presence, just um, tighten up the security about yourself and the privacy about your children even more to prevent things from like that happening. But the, the biggest tool we can do is educate, educate the children because no matter what, whether they have devices or not, what type of devices, they're going to find a way to communicate on the internet, and that's okay. But we just have to arm them with the right tools so that they know how to be safe and how to even help their friends be safe. Hey, that person's not in your best interest. You should stop talking to them. Here's why I know that this is a word that um, somebody who was a kid would not use. You know, something like that. Because a lot of times these adults are, are posing as children um, to kind of get the trust of the person they're targeting. Wow. Well, Stacy, thank you so much. Sure. I mean, is there anything else that I already asked this, but anything else that you want to leave with or that, you know, you wanted to make sure that we covered before? No, I think that's covered it all. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much. Sure. And I will post all those res uh, resource links that you talked about online as well on wavy.com so people can view the sites for education, view the site for take it down and sort of know more. So if you're watching, um, head to wavy.com and we'll have all those links for you up shortly so that you can also get the education that we've been talking about today. So Stacey, thank you so much for joining me today. Sure, thanks for having me. Thank you so much.